Okay, well, um, thank you. With that kind of ovation, I can just leave now. Uh, so um, thank you for that introduction. So yeah, I'm, I'm an astrophysicist. I'm an observer. I use different telescopes uh, on Earth and in space, mostly to study supernovae, which are the explosions of stars. Um, I also study tidal disruption events, which are bright flares that you get when a star is silly enough to get too close to a supermassive black hole and get spaghettified. Um, that's the actual term. But today I'm going to talk about something completely different. Okay? Today I'm going to talk about the Milky Way as it may have been perceived in ancient Egypt. And the key word here going forward is may. Okay, so um, for the last year or so, um, I, uh, I wrote a book about galaxies. It'll be out this August. Um, and the book, any book on galaxies, has to have a chapter on the Milky Way. And I wanted to uh, look into the mythology of the Milky Way. Where does the name come from? You know, the name comes from... Greek mythology, uh, but I didn't want to just stop at Greek mythology. I wanted to show a few others. And the more I read about the subject, uh, the more fascinated I became, and I, uh, I've become a full-on collector of Milky Way mythologies. So if any of you, um, you know, speak other languages or come from um, non-Western cultures, um, I'd be happy to hear what the Milky Way is called in your language and whether it has some interesting origin story. These are just a few of the ones that um, I've been reading about. Um, this one from the Navajo, this is Father Sky, and you can see the Milky Way here as this zigzag pattern across his shoulders. Uh, in China, uh, the Milky Way is called the Silver River. Uh, a designation that has also traveled to Japan, Korea, and Vietnam. Uh, and in Ukraine, I really like this. This is a modern painting by an Ukrainian artist. The Milky Way is called the Chumax Road after uh, these merchants who uh, carried salt from salt mines. And so the Milky Way was created when some of the salt was dropped behind them. And there are lots and lots and lots of these stories. And as I wrote, I also chanced on what looked like a really, really cool story about the Milky Way from ancient Egypt. But the more I dug into it, because I needed to find a reference, I needed to find a scientific reference that, that showed me where this came from, the more I dug into it, the more concerned I became. And this is how I got into, uh, into Egyptology. And so what, I, what I've learned over the last year or so is that the ancient Egyptians were keen observers and documenters of nature. Uh, and documentation is really important in history and archeology span because this is really the way we learn about ancient cultures. And so if you look at um, Egyptian visual media, for example, murals found in tombs, you can see a huge diversity of birds and fishes uh, and mammals that are painted so exactly that 3,000 years later, we can take these paintings and we can use them to classify the different animals that were present in ancient Egypt. Uh, and there are these beautiful books. I'm, I'm a birder. Um, you know, I like to go out and, and observe birds. And I have all these manuals at home, uh, you know, the birds of Britain, birds of Europe, birds of Eastern United States. There's a book, Birds of Ancient Egypt, written by an Egyptologist who went through all the sculptures and paintings uh, and basically documented the birds that lived in ancient Egypt. Uh, you know, just an example. This is an Egyptian goose. Okay, you can see them in London, actually. Uh, 
The other ones I, can, I, I, I can't classify off the top of my head. This looks like a little egret, actually. We can see them here in the UK. This is a cat. <laughs> uh, and so you, you, know, you look at this, you would expect that they would also document the night sky. And the night sky did play a very important role in Egyptian culture, uh, in its mythology, its religion, and also in timekeeping, uh, as you'll see in a second. Uh, so there are some uh, textual references to the night sky from sources dating back 4,000 years and more. Uh, and there are visual uh, sources as well. This is one of the earliest. This is half of a uh, ceiling mural in the tomb of Senenmut, who was a high official in the court of the Queen Hatshepsut. And uh, I'll show you both halves. And here we have a few things. Uh, we, have, we have some of the planets. This has been uh, identified as Venus. Here we have Saturn and Jupiter. Here we have um, two important constellations. Uh, Sopdet, which uh, it's this uh, hieroglyph here, uh, this uh, triangle. Uh, Sopdet has been identified as Sirius, and Sach, uh, which I don't see. I'll show you his, uh, here he is. These are the hieroglyphs for Sach. Sach has been identified with parts of Orion. Uh, and then we have a few constellations here which Egyptologists are still trying to uh, match to asterisms in the night sky. Uh, and this is one list of decans. The decans are a group of stars and asterisms, where an asterism is a group of stars, like a constellation, which Egyptologists think were used as, um, as a star clock to tell time during the night. So the idea here is that each of these stars rises in succession. And if you see one of these stars rise uh, at a given, rise just above the horizon, if you wait 10 days, the next star in the list will be the star that you see rising over the horizon. That's why they're called decans, okay, from this 10 days. Here again, Egyptologists have managed to identify what some of these stars are, but they're still working out um, all the others. So this is the southern half of the mural. This is the northern half of the mural. And here we have a few more constellations. This is uh, this is one of, the, one of the constellations that has been identified. I'll show it to you uh, in a better format in a second. Uh, and then we have, we have these circles. There are 12 of these, one for each month. The, the words above each circle, that's the name of the month. And each circle is divided into 24 sections. So Egyptologists think that these 24 sections represent the 24 hours in the day. Different cultures came up with different ways to tell time, with different ways to mark a day, a week, a year. Uh, the ancient Egyptians came up with a 365-day year um, with uh, days that uh, were made up of 24 hours, so very much like our own. Okay, so as I said, some Egyptian constellations have been identified. Others are still a work in progress. Here are uh, two more representations of Sopdet, Sirius, and Sach. And here it's, it's easier to see why Egyptologists think that Sach is Orion. If you take a look at the hieroglyphic, it kind of, look like, it kind of looks like the three stars on Orion's belt. <laughs> along with the sword coming down. 
This is Meshetiu. Uh, Meshetiu is uh, known in Egyptian as the bull's foreleg, and it has been uh, very convincingly identified with uh, what we call the plow or the Big Dipper. And this is the subject of today's talk. This is Nut. And Nut might be associated with the Milky Way. And the rest of this talk is going to be devoted to why some Egyptologists think this and what I think about it. <clears throat> so Nut is the goddess of the sky. There are a few Egyptian cosmologies, uh, each one uh, developed in a different city in Egypt. Nut belongs to the cosmology that developed in Heliopolis. And in this cosmology, at first, there was the void. And this void was an endless expanse of inert water. And out of this void, the God who is everything created himself. And this God is called Atum. And he is also associated with the sun. Atum then created Shu and Tefnut, the brother and sister. Shu and Tefnut then created their own family and had uh, a daughter, Nut, and a son, Geb. And Nut and Geb between them had four children, Osiris, Isis, Nephthys, and Seth. And each one of these gods represents something. Atum is the sun, Shu is the atmosphere, um, Tefnut is humidity, Nut is the sky, Geb is the earth. And it was the way they imagined this the sky was there to protect the earth from being flooded by the waters of the void. Okay, and Shu, the atmosphere, holds Nut up as the sky. The sun, which you can see here, the sun was also identified with a few other gods. This here is Ra uh, in his falcon-headed form. And the sun was thought to sail on the waters of the sky. And here we see the sun rising in the east, being carried across the sky in the sun bulk, before once again setting in the west, heading towards uh, the open arms of Osiris. And this is because another part of the mythology uh, claimed that as the sun uh, set in the west uh, during the evening, it was swallowed by Nut. And then during the night, it made its way through her body, which was also identified with the netherworld, the Dwat. And as it sailed through her body, it would meet Osiris at around midnight. And Osiris would re-enervate the sun. It would regenerate the sun. And the sun, Ra, would then continue to sail through Nut's body until she gave birth to it once again and it rose in the east uh, as dawn broke. So uh, about uh, 30 uh, years ago, three different Egyptologists said, you know what? We think that Nut is the Milky Way. And we think this because of different reasons. Uh, Virginia Davis, back in 1985, said, you know what? In one of the ancient texts, the pyramid texts, um, it's claimed that Nut separates the skies into a northern sky and a southern sky. You can say the same thing about the Milky Way. R.A. Wells, in 1992, went a bit further. He was also an astronomer and an Egyptologist, 
and using planetarium software from the time, he said, hey, look, in, look at the Milky Way. It looks exactly like Knud does in uh, the different uh, tomb paintings and funerary papyri. It looks arched. And this area where the Milky Way kinds of, kind of divides into two strands, that can be Knud's legs. And uh, I'm going to place her head in Gemini, and I'm going to place her groin in Cygnus. And um, he thought that it would be in Cygnus because uh, many Stone Age cultures used to uh, put a cross on uh, female clay figurines to show, the, to show that that was the groin. And what does Cygnus look like? Cygnus, which is the swan in, uh, in Greek constellations, Cygnus is also called the Northern Cross. Cross, cross, has to be the same. Uh, he also tried to connect, uh, to connect this to the equinoxes uh, because astronomers love equinoxes. Uh, we just had one. Um, it's a really cool time of year. Many cultures um, see um, special significance in, uh, in the equinoxes, so why not? Uh, and he came up with this idea that um, the key moments in the, Mil in the Milky Way's uh, connection to Newt um, are in the spring and the winter, which are nine months apart. So the way he sees it, um, the Milky Way swallows the sun, and then nine months later, the sun is reborn. Nine months, nine months is a human pregnancy. Well, 10 months, but never mind, nine months. Um, and you know, from that, he, he went from a daily story of the sun setting and rising, dying and being reborn, to something that's a pregnancy. Lots of problems uh, with this interpretation. Among them that, uh, while well, it's true that many Stone Age cultures use the, you know, put crosses on uh, female figurines, the Egyptians don't seem to be in that category. Okay. The same year, an art historian uh, called Ariel Kozlov came up with her own model. Um, she was studying a group of makeup spoons called swimming girl spoons um, that all have the same mold, basically. You have uh, a naked woman holding something. And Ariel Kozlov said, Nut is usually shown naked. Most, uh, most female goddesses are not. Most female goddesses are, um, wear dresses. Um, and, and the swimming girls are also naked, and they're holding something. What if, it, what if whatever they hold has um, a figurative significance? The lotus is the sun. A goose is Geb. Geb, the earth god, is associated with geese. His son is associated with ducks. So when she holds a duck, that's Geb's son. There are, as she notes, there are also spoons where the a uh, swimming girl holds a gazelle. Never mind. Um, as every theorist will tell you, don't let facts ruin your theory. Okay. She then also said, Cygnus. Cygnus is the thing. But Cygnus means swan. There are no swans in Egypt. Um, so they must have, the ancient Egyptians must have seen in this a different long-necked bird, I'm quoting, um, such as a goose. Remember I told you that there's this uh, really cool manual about birds in ancient Egypt from visual media? There are two types of swans attested in that manual. Um, uh, Buick swan and, uh, mute, and mute swans. The mute swans are the ones we get here in the camp. So, okay, doesn't work, but okay, so it's a goose. Why would the Egyptians look at what we call the swan constellation and see a swan themselves? That's not far-fetched. 
it's, it's not necessarily far-fetched. There, um, there is rich research that shows that cultures across the world often latch on to the same asterisms. The Pleiades play a significant role. So does the Big Dipper and Orion. Uh, but, they're not, but they're not always given the same associations. Okay, we just saw, for example, that what we call, well, the plow in the UK, the Big Dipper in the US, um, to the ancient Egyptians was the leg of a bull, something completely different. So no need to assume that they would have seen a long-necked bird. And she then said, well, if it's my spoons, then Nut needs to reach her arms out towards Cygnus. But that would place her head in the, uh, in the east instead of in the west, completely contradicting the, the Egyptian mythology. And so at this point, I said, you know what? This is just, th there's nothing here. There's nothing here. But the imagery is so evocative, and the story is so cool. And I told it to my daughters, and they loved it. And they kept, they kept asking me to tell them the story about Newt over and over again. That I said, I have to have this in my book. But I can't have it in my book if it's not true. So I decided to try and look into this myself. And again, I am going to emphasize this. I am not an Egyptologist. Okay? I'm an astrophysicist uh, meddling in someone else's backyard. Uh, but I say, and <laughs> I don't read hieroglyphics. I learned to identify a few, but I, I don't know the language. Uh, but I said, you know what, let's, let's see what people have done. There are translations of uh, many of the ancient Egyptian texts. Let's go over them and let's find every mention of Nut and see what we can learn from that. And at the same time, let's also use modern planetarium software to see what the Milky Way looked like at any given point from different locations in Egypt and see whether things really match up in any significant way. So uh, the three sources which were uh, most, uh, most important for my work were the pyramid texts, the coffin texts, and the Book of Nut. And I put them on this timeline here um, to emphasize that we're going to look at texts that are more than 4,500 years old. We're going back to the dawn of human writing. And that's cool. <laughs> look, I'm an astrophysicist. The things I deal with are billions of years old. Um, but then, you know, you get to what humanity has done and I know that Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson always talk about how humanity is just, you know, barely a second, uh, barely the last second in the current history of the universe. But we have more than 4,000 years of textual history. We've been writing things to ourselves for thousands of years, and we are still around here to read that. The pyramid texts are a collection of spells etched into the burial chambers inside the pyramids of the pharaohs, both kings and queens, um, uh, that are there to help them make the transition to the afterlife. Um, and some of, those some of those spells call on Nut to help the deceased. That's from the Old Kingdom. When we go into the Middle Kingdom, we start to see some of these texts written on coffins. Um, the, some of them are the same, some of them have changed, right? I mean, over hundreds of years, texts change. So those are the coffin texts. And then in the New Kingdom, um, we have a few, uh, a few tombs of uh, pharaohs in which we find a book that uh, we now know is called The Fundamentals of the Course of the Stars. Uh, that was the name given to it by the Egyptians. But for decades before that was found out, it was called the Book of Nut. 
And so between us, we'll continue to call it the Book of Nud just because it's shorter. Okay, so the, the Book of Nut gave me the most information. Uh, this is part of the Book of Nut. This is the part that relates to Nut herself. Uh, over here along her body, we have another list of decans, uh, starting here with, this is once again, this is Sobdet, this is Sirius, and then this is Sach, Orion, and so on. And we have Shu holding her up. Um, here, this, these are lists of ephemerides for the different decans. Uh, but the parts that uh, are of interest to me here are, are these texts, which tell us, uh, give us a description of Nut herself. And the important things are that she's described as, once again, having her head in the West and more specifically the western horizon, and her groin or rear in the eastern horizon, and she swallows the god, the sun, and, if you, and she also swallows the stars that come after him. These are the Deccan stars. Uh, and what's really important is that her right arm is on the northwest side her left arm is on the southeast side. So if you remember, you know, if we look at visual media, Egyptian visual media was two-dimensional by choice, I think, right? So Nut is always shown in this two-dimensional form with her arms forward. But what the text is telling us is that she is a three-dimensional being, right? Uh, with her head in the west, rear in the east, and her arms at a 45 degree angle to her body. And this is really specific, right? They didn't say her left arm is in the east, her right arm is in the west, uh, in, in the north and the south. They, they gave her an angle. We'll return to that in a second. So a few things we need to remember going forward about Nut. We have to remember, she has to swallow the sun every night and give birth to it again every morning. She also gives birth to the Deccan stars as they rise during the night, and then she swallows them as they set. That means that Nut has to be static. She is the sky. The sky is always there. Nut is always there. Her head has to be locked to the western horizon, so that she can keep on swallowing the stars as the night progresses. Her rear has to be locked to the eastern horizon because she gives birth to these stars throughout the night. That means that she cannot be mapped onto the Milky Way. The Milky Way rises and sets, okay? Different as you, if you stand uh, not, not, not in our sky, not under our sky, but if you stand outside and you look at the Milky Way, as the night goes by, you'll see that the Milky Way seems to move and set, right? Different regions rise and set. So you can't say that Newt's head is in Gemini and her rear is in Cygnus. And you, you, you can't do anything like that because that would imply that her head would set that she herself would have to rise and set with the Milky Way. So, have I, dis have I disproved that there's any connection between Nut and the Milky Way? No. Remember the angle. So, let's try this. Ooh, nice, okay. So, this is, uh, this is uh, a screenshot from a planetarium software called Carte de Seal. Um, and here we see the Milky Way. Uh, this is uh, during the summer months, and this is the winter months. The Milky Way is a dynamic thing. It doesn't always look like this, okay? Um, during the night, as I, said, it'll, as I said, it'll rise and set, and from week to week, it'll look slightly different on the sky. But in general, if you look at the night sky when the Milky Way is highest up, so it's easiest to see, then during the summer months, this is its orientation, northeast to southwest, 
and during the winter, it flips and it's oriented southeast to northwest. This is the same, uh, the same kind of thing, but this time using Stellarium. And here again, this is the Milky Way during the winter and southeast to northwest. This is consistent with the orientation given in the Book of Nut. This would be her left arm, this would be her right arm. And then this is the Milky Way in the summer. During the summer, it's, easy, it's easier to see because you're looking in, uh, inwards towards the center of our galaxy. This is looking towards the center of our galaxy. Um, and so you're seeing the most stars, it's brightest. Uh, and you know, just like uh, the Egyptologist noted, it looks like the arched figure that we see in the paintings. But we have a problem here. The Book of Nut only gave us the winter orientation. I did not find any mention of the summer orientation. Not only that, but that would require Nut to be an acrobat um, and to kind of flip with the Milky Way. Maybe they saw it that way, maybe not, I don't know. Um, what I suggest is something a bit different. I suggest that the Milky Way is not an embodiment of Nut, but a way to highlight the fact that she's there, that she's the sky. So you can, what, I, what I'm saying is that you can think of the Milky Way as a spotlight. During the winter, it's shining up and illuminating her arms. And then during the, during the summer, it's showing you her backbone or her torso, connecting between her head and her ear. And there is reason to, there are other reasons to make these connections, going back to the multicultural mythology of the Milky Way. Like I said, I've been reading a lot about this lately. Uh, and the more you read, the more you, the more you see that the same images keep appearing and reappearing. And so this is one page out of the Codex Borgia. Uh, it's from a book that was created by the uh, Tlachacaltec people of Me Mexico. Uh, apologies to the Tlachacaltec if I mispronounce uh, their names. Uh, I, I don't know how to do this quite quite uh, quite right yet. Uh, but in several of these pages, you see these uh, elongated figures at the bottom. They're called skirt goddesses. Uh, and some of them are shown giving birth to Quetzalcoatl, who is uh, a main god associated with Venus. And so Susan Milbrath um, has shown very convincingly, I have to say very convincingly, that these uh, skirt goddesses are the Milky Way, uh, associated with a goddess called Sitlalikwe, who is known as the mother of the gods and gives birth to several of them, including Quetzalcoatl, who is associated with Venus. So here we have a culture that's separated by an ocean and by thousands of years, should never have had any contact, yet we see the same kind of imagery an elongated goddess who gives birth to um, important celestial objects. Newt also played uh, several important roles in the transition to the afterlife. Uh, Newt protects the deceased and uh, helps them reach the sky where they are reborn as imperishable stars, stars that don't seem to rise or set in the night sky. Here we see Nut. This is her name here, Nut. This is Nut uh, providing food to the deceased. This is a chantress called Tentamon. Uh, and she also provides uh, water for the chantress's ba which isn't exactly spirit, um, it's part of what we would call um, a person spirit. 
here we see Nut with her hands outstretched protecting the coffin in which the deceased lay. Nut was also known, her name was the coffin and the tomb and the sarcophagus. And Nut was also uh, called the ladder. She, there are several spells in the pyramid text and the coffin text that call on Nut to give her arm to the deceased so that she can take him up to the sky or act as a ladder so that he can climb up to the sky. And it, once in the sky, he can make the journey to become one of the imperishable stars. And this is consistent with many other cultures who see the Milky Way as a spirit's road. There are many, many instances of this uh, in North America and Central America, um, as well as uh, across other continents. Maybe even in medieval Europe, I'm still looking into that. There's a really nice uh, etching showing angels leading uh, the spirits of the dead up uh, along the winding, uh, winding Milky Way with clouds around them, uh, but I'm still looking into it. So, so do I think Nut was linked to the Milky Way? Maybe. <laughs> and really, I think that maybe is most of what we can say about uh, ancient history to begin with. Unless you have a text or a painting with arrows saying, this thing in the sky and this goddess are the same, you don't know. We have these things for some cultures. We have this uh, in Latin and Greek for the Milky Way, for example. Um, we don't in this case. We have maybes. Uh, I do think that uh, not the Milky Way's uh, winter orientation is consistent with the way she's described in the Book of Nut. I think that's the one piece of evidence we have. I think that her roles in the afterlife um, and in the bird migration, which I didn't go into, are consistent with other cultures. And I think that whether or not this uh, turns out to be real, I think it's a really cool story. Uh, and you can see Nut for yourself uh, here in Cambridge. The Fitzwilliam Museum has uh, a coffin set, several inter, uh, interlayered coffins, uh, where you can see Nut twice. There's uh, one image that's very similar to the one that opened this talk, except she, she doesn't have the stars along her body. And there's this one, which is a little bit different because it's not Shu holding her up, it's Heka, the god of magic. Uh, and he's flanked by uh, two adoring Ba birds, which I think is really nice. So with that, I will stop here and I'll be happy to take questions. Yeah, there are, um, there, are, there are several changes. So uh, it seems that in the Old Kingdom, uh, the netherworld was associated with Nut's body. Uh, but as time went on, the netherworld became uh, something that was underground. Uh, and uh, in, the, in, in a commentary to the Book of Nut from... I don't know if, if it's New Kingdom or even later, uh, the commentator tries to square that and runs into issues. Are there Egyptians believe that the earth is flat? 
I don't know. I don't think we know. I don't think we know. Uh, there's, a, there's an interesting image um, on a sarcophagus, a stone sarcophagus in the Metropolitan Museum that shows the world as a disk. Well, the world is mostly Egypt um, and it's surrounding uh, the deserts on, on, on the two sides and some of what you know, they knew beyond that. Uh, and, um, excuse me, Nut is arched over all of that. That's, that's why I know of this. And some Egyptologists claim that from this, it must be that the Egyptians thought of the world as round and maybe even, you know, a sphere. I don't know, I don't, I don't see it. Yeah. Okay, um, are you, so we're gonna have a refreshment break now. Are you happy to maybe stay around if people have any more yeah, of questions in the break? Wonderful, okay, so there'll be tea and biscuits and then a planetarium show in about 10 minutes or so. Uh, let's